My name is Nitha Gupta. I'm the uh, VP of Product and Founder at Dory AI. And today, we're really going to start to focus on how do you create computer vision applications on embedded ARM devices? We've all heard a lot of talk today and yesterday about uh, sort of the process of building machine learning models. And today, we really want to focus on trying to give you a sense of what that process really looks like when you actually want to build out a practical application. So Dory, at Dory, we provide a, a full end-to-end -end solution that enables you to take all that data and create a computer vision application out of it. And so as you start to build out this embedded uh, application, you really want to start to think about what are the tools, frameworks, and infrastructure that I need to build out this solution? If you look at the way deep learning has evolved over the last uh, couple of years, a few trends are evident. Deep learning frameworks and tools have reached a level of maturity that have led to a high level of model accuracy. And we've seen an explosion of images and videos being generated from various sources. This has opened the door for millions of computer vision applications and use cases to be built, and many of them being deployed even on the edge. And we've seen this applied across a number of different industries within embedded intelligent cameras, mobile devices, and even hybrid uh, solutions on cloud and edge. Uh, Peter uh, Warden touched on a few of these this morning um, in, across a number of these different industries. But what do you really need to build an embedded computer vision application? The first thing you need to consider is where are you going to deploy this application? There are three main uh, deployment targets when it comes to machine learning applications, that being cloud, edge server, and edge devices. And each of these have various uh, requirements based on compute and processing loads. On the cloud, you're going to tend to uh, schedule more resource intensive and compute intensive workloads, whereas on the edge, you're much more constrained. You're going to have to worry about things like latency, bandwidth, privacy of data, et cetera. And because of those resource limitations of memory, processing speed, and power, you're going to have to figure out what do you do on the edge, what do you possibly do on an edge server that's connected to these edge devices, and what do you do on the cloud. It may not be a simple solution that, uh, that you come up with. It may be, end up being a, a very hybrid solution. Now, if you look at what the hardware vendors provide in terms of support for machine learning frameworks, most chipset providers provide a set of tools, drivers, and hardware runtimes that enable these machine, lear uh, machine learning workloads to run optimally on their hardware. And it starts with providing an inference engine that supports most of the major frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Keras. At a high level, they provide a SDK or library that enables these neural networks to run efficiently and what they do is they compile these neural networks down into usually an intermediate representation that can then be translated into a set of sequenced or parallel instructions. These sequenced instructions can then be fed either to a CPU, a GPU, NPU, or even an FPGA. And underneath the hood, these, this hardware can either harden some of those IP cores so that you can actually run these CNNs much more efficiently, or they may be just uh, taking advantage of a lot of the parallel processing that these uh, GPUs and CPUs have within them. If you look at what ARM provides, they provide a similar stack. And uh, they've abstracted the hardware and software in a similar fashion. They've provided the ARM NN SDK, which abstracts the underlying hardware scheduling for any of these major ML frameworks. And depending on what you're trying to optimize for, whether it be CPU, GPU, or now the latest uh, Ethos NPU, ARM provides a number of these uh, underlying drivers, compute libraries, and uh, so that you can target the right hardware uh, for your application. But what else is required? What else do you need to build this embedded vision application? The answer is a lot. Imagine you wanted to build, say, a simple helmet or safety application. What would you need to actually do this? The first step of this process is data collection. If you're working in, say, an industrial market or um, a factory, that data generally doesn't leave the factory floor or the industrial floor. That data needs to be kept private and on-premise. So how do you deal with such a situation? Also, you need to annotate that data. 
that data is not going, you're not going to be able to leverage just an off-the-shelf model. You're going to have to annotate it for specific use cases and specific scenarios, and also varying conditions like blur in the camera image or various lighting conditions, day versus night, uh, different poses. If, if people are bending down, are you going to be able to detect whether they're still wearing a helmet or not? And then if you're doing a large-scale deployment, you may end up having thousands of cameras spread out throughout various different geographies. So how do you aggregate that data? How do you collect all of that data and actually meaningfully annotate that data? The other thing is when you're having multiple cameras in a room, how are you going to know if that camera is detecting the same person as that camera? How do you reconcile that? These are things that you have to think about when you're actually building your application because they have serious impacts on the decisions that your application is going to make. And that's even before you even start building the model. Once you get to building the model, you're going to have to iterate through this process multiple times. You're going to have lots of data sets and lots of models to choose from. How do you actually uh, make a structured decision on what model to use and what data set to use to train that model? And then when you go to deploy, how are you going to manage all of these devices? So these are all things that you need to start thinking about when you actually build out your application, because it's not a simple process of just building a model. If you were to lay out this entire process, it becomes quite an eye chart. Um, I'm not going to really walk through this entire process, because really we want to simplify this to something that's more understandable. So let's simplify that process. Let's distill this into four main steps. And you've seen these charts probably uh, in a number of different talks. The first step of that process is, where are your data sources? Where are they coming from? Where are these images and videos coming from? Second step of that process is annotation, or preparing your data. You may need to apply some pre-processing uh, to these images before you can even make them usable for your models. The third step of that process is where you start to actually get into the model building process. And I'll d dig into uh, what are some of these things that you need to consider uh, in the subsequent slides. And then finally, how do you actually start to deploy and monitor this in the field? So when you're actually <coughs> selecting the input infrastructure and the output infrastructure for your uh, application, there are sort of three main things that you need to consider. On the input side, what are your data sources? Uh, how are your data sources coming in? Is it a streaming interface? Is it a batch uh, interface? Or is it just a single inferencing that you want to accomplish? And so based on that information, you can set up your, your input connectors uh, to either use something like a real-time streaming protocol or a connection to an AWS bucket where you're just uploading images or videos to a cloud bucket and then consuming it from there. Second is the data format. Is your data in images? Is it videos? Do you need to extract frame by frame? These are all things that you need to consider because they all have impacts of, in your overall latency of the pipeline that you're going to build. The more software that you run in terms of pre-processing, if you're running on the same device, that means that that processing can't be used for the actual machine, learn, machine learning workloads. And so you really need to consider that balance of what do you do in terms of pre-processing versus what you do when it comes to inference. And then on the output side, you have to take a look at what are the inference results that you're collecting and how are you going to use that data within your application. The model output is generally not the thing that you'd use for your actual application. It's actually some application logic or some secondary logic that you're going to use to post-process that data and then actually uh, make a decision within your application. And so when it comes to uh, connecting up all of that data, you're going to want to look at what database connectors do I need? Do I need to feed this data to a, a BI tool like Tableau? These are all things that you need to really consider when it comes to building out that end-to-end -end solution. Second step of that process is the image preprocessing that I mentioned. <clears throat> and here's where you really want to think about what am I trying to actually detect a lot of situations, you don't need a full frame rate video to actually uh, build out that solution. For example, in that helmet detection uh, use case, or, or when you're trying to detect when somebody's just walking, you may not need to do every single frame and, and do inference on every single frame, because that's going to cost you a lot of uh, cycles. So you may want to reduce the frame rate. Secondly, you may want to just look at just a part of the image, not the whole image itself, uh, because the area of interest is, is just in that corner of the video. Um, if you want to actually also increase the amount of uh, data that you need, 
because you possibly don't have enough data, you may want to apply certain techniques like GAN or, or uh, synthetic data generation to help improve the quality of your data sets. Um, and this, there's many different techniques that have been proposed in the R&D. You really want to start to look at how do I improve the quality of my model through the use of augmenting my data. The next step of that process is the annotation phase. When you annotate your data, uh, you may have to not just do bounding boxes, you may actually have to go to pixel level segmentation to actually get the accuracy uh, to the point which you need. And today, most, of the, most companies are spending a lot of time in just this phase itself because bad data means bad results. And so you end up spending a lot of time annotating your data and you wanna try and find ways that will help you automate that process. So you can possibly pre-process your, your image streams or your video streams before you even get to the annotation phase and then use the annotation phase to just uh, tweak those annotations to correct any imperfections that may have, been, uh, that may have occurred during the pre-processing phase. When you get to training and benchmarking your model, this is where you want to start to look at what are the models that are already out there? What are the use cases that are already out there that I can leverage? Because at the end of the day, you're de delivering a solution. So you, want to, you don't want to reinvent the wheel here. So take a look at what uh, public domain models, what pre-trained models are available already, and how can I then bring my own data and just retrain that using transfer learning or other techniques that have been proposed. You can also uh, possibly take a look at AutoML. Uh, there's a lot of techniques which help you automate that process of actually selecting a model. Um, but keep in mind that using techniques like AutoML can get very costly. So you may have a product manager behind your back saying, hey, you got this budget, don't be uh, kicking off these servers uh, without considering the actual cost of training these models. And when it comes to training these uh, models, there's gonna be various uh, hyperparameters that you're gonna have to tune. And so what you wanna uh, take into consideration is that this is gonna be an iterative cycle where you would set some hyperparameters, train the model, benchmark it, and then possibly retrain that model after you've optimized it. So that way then you're actually taking into account that that optimization within the training cycle itself. So if you're taking a look at, for example, a trying to take that model from cloud to edge, you would want to retrain that model after you've quantized and pruned it, so that way then it feeds back uh, a much better, higher accuracy level and that you're training uh, this model with the original data set on a pruned or quantized model. The benchmarking phase is actually uh, a phase that most uh, enterprises have started to, uh, have not really looked at very deeply, and it's a very important part of the process that's separate from the training process. There's obviously the training and validation split, but if you look at it from a, a deployment standpoint, you need to actually benchmark your model for both the model accuracy as well as the system metrics when it comes to the actual deployment scenario. You want to test that model on actual hardware and not just on one data set, but multiple data sets because you don't want to overfit your model. You want to make sure that the model that you've trained can actually work very well when it comes to data it hasn't seen. And so it's very important to uh, schedule the uh, time in your, in your development cycle to actually benchmark across multiple data sets and possibly multiple deployment frameworks. So if you're deploying a single model across different sites, you wanna make sure that it's performing at each of those sites because it may be that each of those uh, sites are uh, feeding different types of data that you didn't actually train the model for. And when it gets to the deployment, again, you want to consider where, sh where is the best use of those resources when it comes to actually processing these, uh, uh, these images or these videos. Do I process all that data in the, in the Edge device itself? or do I pr just do some pre-processing and then just send metadata to the cloud and do sort of a hybrid type of uh, inferencing where maybe I just detect if, if somebody's in motion on the edge device, but then when I detect that motion, I start to start streaming that up to a cloud and do a much more beefier uh, inference on the cloud. The other aspect also is uh, how are you gonna keep track of all of the devices, right? It's possible that you may deploy multiple models to multiple devices. So you're gonna to have to keep in mind how do you version control all your models and how do you manage which models are going to which device. And then the other aspect of the deployment is how are you gonna package this up? Um, on edge devices, you may have to actually embed an SDK to actually manage all of this uh, model traffic. 
Um, but what's become quite popular nowadays is the ability to use Dockers, right? You Dockerize all of your software so that it's portable across uh, multiple sites. And then the last phase of this process is that active learning loop where you're tar starting to monitor your models in the field. And this is a piece of software that's constantly collecting images and videos uh, so that you can feed that back into your training and uh, annotation cycle. So you may, may need to uh, set up some capture policies based on the constraints of your uh, deployment. Uh, so for example, you may want to just sample every other frame or every other uh, day even, uh, depending on what the application is. But you need to really consider when it comes to even monitoring how much of your compute is gonna be reserved for collecting that data. And so it's a, it's a delicate balance between uh, doing the inference and, and using the compute for inferencing, but also how do you improve your model on the fly? Are you gonna start to collect it uh, very regularly or are you gonna uh, just do it every so often? So the key takeaway here is when, you're, when you start building out these use cases, you really need to think of it from a platform perspective. You can't just silo yourself on one phase of this life cycle or one part of this life cycle. You really need to think about the end-to-end -end process and it really boils down to three main entities, the data, the models, and the hardware. And when, you, when they are combined, this can explode into a large permutation of deployments that you need to manage. So really think about how do you sort of build out that full stack solution and uh, really to make it usable, scalable, as well as edge aware. Fortunately, there is a solution to, the, to that problem. Uh, at Dory, we've really uh, focused on trying to enable that end-to-end -end life cycle in a much more usable way. We've provided uh, a unified development environment that really brings all of these three entities into one usable dashboard workflow that scales with your application. Within the platform, you can walk through each application uh, through that entire process of connecting your data, preparing it by pre-processing and annotating those images, training and benchmarking your model, and then finally deploying and monitoring those applications in the field. We also sit on top of all of your hardware compiler tool chains, so the ARM and N, Intel, NVIDIA, we sit on top of all of those frameworks so that you can leverage uh, the hardware acceleration that they provide, and we also enable you to build and deploy your applications on any cloud platform as well. So we are agnostic to AWS or GCP, and that way then you can actually deploy that model uh, even on premise as well uh, within your own security uh, envelope. And so we have specialized tools that give you a much deeper insight into where your model is accurate and where it's performing poorly. So we enable you to extract a lot of imagery and data from these uh, inferences and allow you to then feed that automatically back into your annotation and retraining engine, thereby enabling you to focus your time and energy where it's really needed, which is getting the right data and building out your application and uh, business logic. So just wanna say thank you. Uh, I'll be around for lunch if you have any questions. Um, really like to just understand how you're building out these solutions and how we can really set forth some best practices when it comes to uh, establishing a, a full end-to-end -end process for building out these applications. Thank you.